not sure. Can I use this? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, and I like the music for the countdown, so John, you can do that. Um, thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, thank you, Carlin. And years ago, I used to be a guest speaker when I uh, came from the East Bay. Go East Bay for everyone else who's from the East Bay. And now I've been on faculty for, it'll be two years in March, so um, really happy to be here. I'm working with a great group of people. And it's fascinating to me, having been here all morning, to see how intertwined everything is. So you're going to find common themes as we discuss um, these topics, and I hope that you carry that back with you to your clinical practice. Okay, Ford. All right, uh, I have nothing to disclose. I am trying really hard to be an eternal optimist, and basically, I have not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work, and that's a quote from Thomas Edison. Uh, our objectives review common upper extremity nerve injuries seen in athletes and discuss return to play issues concerning specific uh, upper extremity nerve issues. Okay, so uh, some tips. This is not going to work. I feel like I'm getting feedback. John, I'm going to switch this just to the microphone. Okay, thanks. So some tips that have been discussed. Uh, make sure you have gowns and sheets and paper shorts in your room. And why shorts when we're talking about upper extremity? Because you're gonna have people that come in with neck, shoulder, but then it'll be axial and you wanna look down uh, on their low extremities if, if you have time. Be able to get to both sides of the exam table. I think that's key. When you are looking at and doing the shoulder exam, for example, you want to be able to get behind them. If you're only seeing them like you're the mirror and you're only seeing what's going on in front and you're not seeing posteriorly, you're going to lose a great deal of what you can pick up on your observation. So have your exam table set up so that it's like this and not like this, or be prepared to go around them. Okay, uh, um, and, and at certain of my clinics, I actually ask our athletic trainers, I love you guys, to change uh, the tables in my room so that I can get on either side. Uh, the other thing is, if they're not comfortable undressing in a sports bra, for example, and they only have a bra, for example, and they're uncomfortable in just that, or if they're any male. I mean, I see patients in the East Bay, I see young boys who have got a camastia, they're not comfortable taking their shirt off. So even if they're female or male or whatever gender or sex, you need to ask them, are you comfortable taking your shirt off if not, or what kind of clothing you have on? You can take that gown and tie it around so that you can still cover them, but be able to see the front and the back of their shoulders. Okay, you certainly uh, don't want to do this and you don't want to have that. Uh, this is my first case. Now, the heat, Junior Sale has been in the news a lot because of concussions and we're gonna have some discussion about that and, and brain damage that he suffered. But I remember Junior Sale uh, in his earlier years and I remember him because of this. So this is our first case, 1994, <laughs> I think all of us were born by then, uh, AFC championship game. The San Diego Chargers had upset uh, the Pittsburgh Steelers. And Junior Sale recorded 16 tackles and a forced fumble. But I remember him on TV running around like this, trying to tackle, okay? Um, and it was his left shoulder, actually. So this was, these are quotes from the media that I, that I looked up. Uh, he, he, despite he, he had a phenomenal game despite the fact that, quote, not being able to lift his arm above his shoulder, playing with a bad left shoulder, having a pinched nerve in his neck. Okay, so we all know how accurate the media is, right? But this is how the media reported how well he played. Okay, and this is him running around with a lifeless left arm. So this is what I say. Is the arm not fine? First clear the spine. It is so, so, so important for you to clear the spine because quickly, and I know Dr. O'Neill is going to be talking about this, look at the cervical nerve roots and look where they innervate, where they innervate. And so people may come in and say, my shoulder hurts, but you want to make sure it's not a C5 radiculopathy. And if you take a look at the way the structure is, remember the foramina, the nerve roots, the nerve roots take out about 30% of the foraminal space, see how they come in, if you've got a disc herniation or any injury, how this can happen. And with facet arthropathy or facet pain, this is the dermatomal 
of what can happen with that, uh, with facet arthritis, for example, or inflammation. So C4-5 here, posterior upper back, this is C6-7, um, et cetera. So you have to be aware of that, and this is all in your handout. The other thing is taking a really good history. I totally agree with what Dr. Allen has said, Dr. Feely has said, everyone has said, if you take a good history, you're gonna to get to 80 to 90% of what you need to get in terms of, you should have a very focused exam because you have a good idea of what your differential diagnosis is. And so we all talk about how pain scales will help, uh, using a visual analog scale for the perceived level of pain. Also, anatomical pain drawings will ha oftentimes help you review the pain pattern. Now, this is all in your handbook, and we know about onset mechanism, all this kind of stuff. What do they try? What position do they play? What is their work? How does it affect their life? And as you're asking all these things, previous episodes, um, this is important, any symptoms suggestive of a myelopathy. We all talk about the red flag warnings. These are the really urgent ones. And as you ask all these questions, though, you see this happening. They start to slump on the exam table or the chair. And the problem is this, the dangers of a forward head posture, we start to see this happening, it happens all the time on my exam table, is this is happening and this is how they're sitting and no wonder they're having a lot of problems per se. So take a look at that. Part of my uh, observation is I'll write down sits with slumped shoulders, sits with head protracted because this all affects their ability to improve from whatever diagnosis we give them. Um, I like this mnemonic, old carts, I think you guys may use it. Whatever you're using for EMR, just make sure you're asking all these questions. And this is a really good uh, mnemonic that we use for pain, but I add on MIS. This is how I teach um, medical students, for example. And once you add on MIS, then you can use this for any problem that comes in, any musculoskeletal injury that comes in. You add on the mechanism of injury, and you add on symptoms, and then you can get to all the questions that you need to get, especially when it comes to nerve pain. Um, typical history of a cervical radiculopathy, really just keep focus. Present with neck or arm discomfort of insidious onset. It could be an ache, it could be a burning pain. Initially, don't be surprised if the pain is revered to the medial border of the scapula. Uh, and the chief complaint may actually be shoulder pain when it's indeed coming from the nerve. And then as the radiculopathy progresses, it'll go along the sensory distribution of the nerve root. Um, and the typical history, again, is neck positions, and the sudden narrowing here, if you go into this Sperling's type of sign, you're gonna narrow the foramina, especially you have a disc here, and you're gonna cause radicular pain. So neck positions can cause this to be different. So when you're examining someone that's coming in with nerve pain, shoulder pain, whatever they're saying, look at the neck, go through range of motion, and that's gonna be discussed. And know your dermatomes. This is really, you know, when you're testing your dermatomes, you don't have to do a lot of spots. C5, C6, C7, C8, T1. You've got it right there, okay? Just know consistently when you look at dermatomal maps, and there's a lot of overlap, but those are consistent points on your maps. And then we talk about imaging, and the one thing is, Order seven views of the cervical spine if there's a history of a trauma to the neck, and even distant trauma to the neck. Yeah, I had a fall from a tree when I was a teenager, um, and they're coming in to see you later. Seven views. And oblique views as well will show you the foramina and whether or not there's any osteophytes. Begin Again, if these foramina are narrowed, what's going to happen to the nerve root? There's less space for the nerve root to glide, and you may get the cervical radicular pain. Okay. So if you think it's cervical radiculopathy, most people, patients less than 35, would do very well with a trial of conservative management. And we can talk about medications, rehab modalities if you want to, um, and we can ask those questions later. But you need to emphasize time, activity, posture, restful sleep, time. Uh, the art of medicine consists of amusing the patient while nature cures the disease. I mean, how many times have we found that to be true? And how many times do we find a patient that said, it took me three weeks or four weeks to get in to see you, and I'm better? <laughs> You're like, this great. Emphasize posture. Um, this was the original MAC. It came out when I was in uh, college, I believe. But this is what's been happening with, uh, with the advent of computers. And we... This has also been discussed. Just like when you're just building up your pecs, et cetera, this is what happens. Tight pectoralis, inhibited neck flexors, you start to get tied up here, you start to slump. 
And this is why we encourage ergonomic setup, which is so, so valuable. But now look what's happening. Now we have a new era of our millennials, and even with ourselves, which this is happening to us as we're using our mobile device. So we've got to be careful about this. Okay, so let's go back to Junior Seau. So, or any football player. After making a tackle, the football player jogs off without assistance, but he's carrying his left arm with his right. You question him on the sideline. Which of the followings do not make you think this is a stinger? A, he describes a burning type of pain. B, he describes weakness in only his wrist extensors. C, he feels numbness in both arms. Or D, he is having neck pain. Okay, it's, it's anonymous. Everyone hit a button. Music, John. Music. Dun, 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 dun. Okay. And C. Most of you answered C. He feels numbness in both arms. That's exactly correct. This is not typical to have numbness in both arms with a stinger or a burner. Okay. So what's the definition? Nerve injury resulting from trauma to the neck or shoulder. If you can see this mechanism, there's really... Type, three types of mechanisms that can happen. First, it's a traction injury, or it can be a compression injury, or it's direct blow right over what we call herbs point where the brachial plexus sits. And those three mechanisms can cause uh, this problem. And you may not be on the sideline like some of us are who are team physicians, but if you are there or you're at the event where your kid is playing or you see something else happening, they're going to shake that arm out. It's heavy, they're going to hold it, or they're going to shake it because they need to get some type of sensation back into that arm, okay? It's an immediate onset of burning pain, hence that's why it's called a, you know, stinger or a burner, um, and it's unilaterally and can be associated with numbness or weakness. Typically, it lasts seconds, it goes away, and that's why sometimes when you're watching sports, you'll see that person go back out onto the playing field, and you're like, what? Well, hopefully they've been examined and they're back to full strength. And again, this shows you what happens in this schematic is if you've got other stuff going on like foraminal stenosis where there's not a lot of space for that nerve root to come out or if you have a herniated disc and there's not a lot of space for that nerve root to come out where it can be more of a cervical stinger where the, it's here because of the foraminal narrowing for any reason. All right, or it can be more of a brachial plexus stinger because the traction injury that happens through here. And again, as you're looking at the uh, trunks and the upper roots of this stinger, most of the time it affects this level. You're going to get this distrib distribution of where they feel uh, weakness or where they have weakness or where they feel numbness. Uh, and again, looking at your dermatomes, and this can be quite complex, but knowing where the nerve root goes down will help you get a sense of whether or not you think it's more of a stinger, cervical kind of problem, a cervical reason, or whether or not it's more of a brachial plexopathy. Now, what are your risk factors? Contact sports or spinal stenosis, if you have a narrowing here in the canal, that's certainly a risk factor for a burner or stinger as well. And again, with the symptoms, seconds and minutes. But, but to five to 10% can last longer, uh, hours to days. And you cannot put that person back to play. You cannot clear them to go back to play. Uh, and again, the symptoms we talked about, it can, depending on how they describe it. Now, if you're evaluating kids, and, and half of my practice is, is seeing uh, athletes uh, or kids under the age of 25 on the East Bay, and then I'm over here in, in Mission Bay seeing adults. But uh, when you're covering high school kids or you're covering younger kids who are playing sports, they don't know what radiation of pain. They're not sure what that feels like. It doesn't feel like a nerve pain. So I oftentimes will just say, have you ever hit your funny bone? Most, most of them have already, and then that's how you describe it. It's like how you feel when you hit your funny bone. And that's how I use to describe it to them, okay? So this is my suggestion to you all. I would work this up if the weakness lasted several days, uh, if they have recurrent stingers, this is not the first time this has happened to them, if they're having any neck pain that's persistent, especially if they're palpable neck pain, and if they have atypical system, symptoms like both of their arms were burning, okay? And certainly if all four arms or legs were burning, that's more of a transient quadriparesis type of symptoms, and that's a different uh, type of situation. 
What would you include? The radiographs, as, as we discussed, and you would say seven views if it's trauma, because you want the obliques and you want the flexion extension, lateral flexion extension, that's what you would write. Um, and then you could get an MRI of the cervical spine, certainly, and if they're still weak, EMG nerve conduction study. Please, 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 don't order it now because it's got to get authorized. I mean, if you're seeing someone and it's already been like 10 days and you're concerned, 10 days to two weeks, order it now for the authorization, but tell them not to schedule it until after three weeks from the date of their symptoms because it's not uncommon for someone to get it too soon and the EMG nerve conduction study is negative and then you think it's, that's negative, right? So make sure we know the timing of when this is done. Okay, case number two. 35-year-old dragon boat racer walks into the clinic to request a prescription for PT for her rotator cuff tendonitis. That's all I need, doc. I just need a PT, just write it for me. I don't have time to make an appointment, it's too long. We've all heard this. You do a very quick exam, because you're very nice. And she is weak when you test all of her rotator cuff muscles. She's just weak. Doesn't have a lot of pain. She's weak. What should you do next? A, order an x-ray. B, check her sensation over her deltoid region. C, visually inspect her shoulder girdle. D, write the PT prescription, but limit it to three weeks with strict follow-up. So when you can get her in to, to do a more thorough exam. Okay, go. Thank you. Okay, survey says, yay. Okay, so visually inspect your shoulder girdle. Uh, and that is what we're hammering home. Now, check your sensation over deltoid, that's good, you could do that. Um, that's C5, but that's not gonna tell you what, what is going on. So we have her unrobe, and this is what we see, okay? Scapular winging. Now, the role of the scapula, so critical, forgotten. It's forgotten, it's forgotten, the poor thing. But it serves as the attachment for 17 muscles. And these are the dynamics. This is what the scapula does. And if the scapula is messed up, it's part of that shoulder girdle, right? If it's messed up, it is gonna cause shoulder pain. So we've gotta be able to understand what the scapula does, or at least look at it, recognize it, respect it, acknowledge that it exists, okay? So here's the motion. Um, the trapezius will elevate and upward rotate, right? Your serratus anterior, the muscles in the front, the pec major, minor, they're gonna help you protract, go forward with the scapula. Uh, scapula retraction, coming back, is gonna be your rhomboids and minor muscles, the muscles in the back, okay? So these are the muscles in the front and they'll pull the shoulder forward and in back, they'll help you retract. But they kind of attach, they all attach to um, the chromium or the spine and the scapula, all these places that we need these muscles to move. Now, look at this scapular stabilizer. This is the serratus anterior. Now, I bet you not must, most of us can see these in our body, um, but sometimes you can see if it's been atrophied in certain types of athletes. But this is where it sits, and it sits and inserts along the ribs, but it sits underneath the shoulder blade. So what happens in this case of winging is the nerve that innervates the serratus anterior is the long thoracic nerve, and it is a branch off the brachial plexus. Now, what I don't have on here is it actually comes off, but the muscles here are the scalenes, and it's coming off in between these. So there's plenty of pl places for this nerve to get entrapped or to get stretched, and it's common for this nerve to be entrapped and stretched if we're dealing with an upper extremity problem and then the neck is going away. So anytime where you're providing traction, where you're causing traction and you're causing this nerve to stretch from the neck all the way down to where it innervates, it's a pretty darn long nerve, it's gonna cause problems. Now, what you need to do when you're looking for winging is you wanna look at their active forward flexion and abduction, but you gotta look at it from behind. Hence, having them sitting on the edge of the table so you can easily go behind and watch them do it. So I'll watch them do it twice. I'll watch them do it from the front and then I'll go behind them and watch them do it from behind them. You wanna watch for the winging on descent 
And you can get some dysfunction as well with rotator cuff tears, with instability, but it won't be so prominent. But what you could do is you'll do a wall push-up where you either, either have them push against your hand or you have go against a wall and push, and that will definitely make that winging more pronounced. And you can see on this uh, photo, examiner is holding the arm in front and she's pushing. And look how this gown is tied, right? This is a good thing. It's modestly uh, tied on the front of her to cover up her brassiere, but in the back you can see everything. If she had a gown on, this would be pretty tough to do. Okay, uh, mechanism of injury to the long thoracic nerve. It could be iatrogenic, um, repetitive stretch injury. Uh, sometimes it can happen viral. I didn't put that on, but can it happen secondarily to a viral infection if they had a upper respiratory infection? Um, but the repetitive stretch injury is the most common. Again, with increased risk when the head is tilted away uh, during overarm head activity. Uh, you can get a compression injury. It's unusual, but if they take a hit there, you know, they can do it. You can do it, especially when the arm is abducted. Uh, and then in terms of treatment, we typically non-operatively will observe. Uh, bracing doesn't, uh, I, I've tried it, um, you know, try to keep the, the scapula against the, uh, uh, the rib cage. What's really helping is taping. So what are athletic trainers or physical therapists doing in terms of using tape to tape the scapula down can be very, very, very helpful. And so we'll ask them to do that. Um, and they, they will typically know how to do it as well. And strengthening of all the surrounding muscles to be able to keep that scapula down as much as possible. There's a minimum of six months before that nerve recovers. You need to reassure, reassure, reassure patients, patients, time. Um, and then if after there's no resolution, after a couple years, you can discuss uh, a pectoralis transfer, uh, a, a neurolysis, basically other things to try to get that nerve to recover. Okay, case three. We've got a 22-year-old right-handed woman. She presents with increasing right shoulder pain despite doing her rehab exercises diligently every day. And this is what you see on observation. Okay, look closely. Look closely at the shadowing. Here's the medial border of the scapula here and here. Okay, look closely here, here, look closely here. Okay, she plays outside hitter on a volleyball team which increased practices to five times a week a month ago preparing for nationals. You suspect what pathology? A, okay, there's a lot of words here, but you can do it. Suprascapular nerve entrapment at the suprascapular notch resulting in atrophy of the supraspinatus. B, suprascapular nerve entrapment at the spinal glenoid notch resulting in atrophy of the infraspinatus and teres minor. C, Suprascapular nerve entrapment at the suprascapular notch, resulting in atrophy of the supraspinatus and the infraspinatus, or D, suprascapular nerve entrapment at the spinal glenoid notch, resulting in atrophy of the infraspinatus. Let me go back to the picture. Okay, and then let's vote. Just put something in, we'll get to it, sorry. I made it, this was kind of hard. Well, what happened? Okay. It wasn't a good question, you got rid of it? Is that what it was? <laughs> okay. All right. All right, survey says, uh-huh. Okay, so the correct answer is D. So this was suprascapular nerve entrapment at the spinal glenoid notch resulting in atrophy of only the infraspinatus. And I can understand uh, why you put B because the teres minor is also an external rotator, but it's not innervated by um, the suprascapular nerve. So here's the pathology. Here we have the suprascapular nerve and this is the suprascapular notch. And you can see it's just really a, a notch in the bone and then there is a ligament over the top of it. And then it comes through and then it's gonna go through the spinal glenoid notch and the branches here innervate the supraspinatus, right? Remember, you can either do empty can or full can to test that as Dr. Feely had discussed. And then we can go down here and once it goes through the spinal glenoid notch, it innervates the infraspinatus. And the infraspinatus does the external rotation, right? So you test it this way. So you can have wasting of the supraspinatus here, and I call this like a bird bath. Can't miss it when they bring it up. There's like just a 
atrophy here, or you can get wasting at the infraspinatus, which is the muscle just below the spine of the scapula. So if there's atrophy of both, the compression is here. If there's only atrophy of the infraspinatus, then compression is at the spinoglenoid notch, okay? And it's usually a traction injury. So with that type of neuropathy, again, if you have both, you would discuss whether or not you would decompress this here and release the ligament. And in terms of this, if it's trapped here, oftentimes there is a cyst there, there's a paralabral cyst here because the joint is right here adjacent, and you can go in and surgically remove the compression. You can also remove and release the spinoglenoid ligament if there's there, if there's a, um, if there's a problem there. So how you evaluate it is non-operatively activity modification. You can do a formal shoulder rehab. Um, rehab performed for minimum six months, EMG nerve conduction study. Now, you have already done an MRI typically as well in the shoulder to make sure there's no mass lesion. Uh, Operative-wise, you can operate on that structural lesion or you can do a nerve decompression if the symptoms are lasting longer than a year and they're having a lot of problems with it. I will say to you that this particular case cemented cemented me as the, um, put it this way, as I started off, it was my first month as a head team physician at Cal. I was pretty young, I was coming out pretty new, um, and one of the volleyball players came in to see me. And she was a returning player, and she'd been having shoulder pain for a year, and they'd been doing rehab and everything like that. Um, and, you know, I, I, I just, I looked at her, and I tested her, and then I, had her take her shirt off, you know, because she was weak, and I, I was saying, you know, I need to need to look at her, and she had atrophy of her infraspinatus, and we diagnosed it, we treated it, uh, we managed her, she got back to playing, uh, but it was one of those seminal moments where I was like, you got to look, you've got to look, you've got to look behind there, because everyone else prior to me had missed it, and actually the, the head coach at the time for the volleyball team, she looked at me and she said, you must be pretty proud of yourself. <laughs> the weirdest thing for her to say, and I'm like thinking to myself, God, thank God I found it, right? But it was one of those seminal moments that kind of says, okay, you learn it, you did it, I found it, but it just kind of reflected what we had been taught and how important it is to do those types of things and then build the confidence of your patients, right? Your patients understand what you're doing, why you're doing it, and you're building that confidence and that relationship with your patients. Okay, so uh, in our last couple minutes, return to play. So when we talk about return to play or return to clearance, so you've got a person and saying, hey, can I go back to my baseball league? Or can I go back and can I start bowling again? And all these things, because you want your patients to be active, when do you return to play? Well, in general, it's very much the same. Pain is resolved full pain-free neck and upper extremity range of motion, normal strength, preferably you have a baseline if you're working with that person, but normal strength uh, according to your strength testing, normal reflexes, negative spurlings, this is a spurlings test where you're closing off the foramina, and negative imaging studies. Negative imaging studies if you've done them because they've had recurrent uh, stingers or burners, for example. That all makes sense, right? Return to play during, uh, if all of these have resolved. Um, these are absolute contraindication return to play with upper extremity nerve injuries. If they've got a symptomatic disc herniation, absolutely contraindicate. Relative contraindication, prolonged symptomatic burner or stinger lasting greater than 24 hours or greater than three stingers, okay? Relative contraindication. And before you return them, they need to have full return of range of motion, normal strength, and no baseline discomfort. No contraindication degenerative disc disease. As long as it's only occasional neck stiffness and pain, no changes in baseline neurological status, or less, th less than three episodes of a stinger lasting less than 24 hours with full range of motion and no neurological deficit. Know that this is expert cons opinion, <laughs> okay? In terms of evidence base for this, there's not a lot. But this is what neurosurgeons, neurologists, this is what we kind of go by. But what I say to you in terms of this return to play or return to activity or return to work is just think about, regardless, there's no universally accepted criteria, but the things that we think about, can the athlete protect themselves from further injury? Can the athlete successfully play their sport? And what are the long-term and short-term risks and benefits? And so if you've got an upper extremity injury, like there's Junior Seau, right, when he was playing, and he had to tackle, yet he was tackling with one arm, 
and he was still a beast, probably using his head and his neck too, which is a problem. But um, that's different than someone who's a soccer player. Okay, so if there's an issue there, this soccer player is someone who's using the low extremities more than upper extremities, maybe you can bend the rules a little bit and clear them to their activity if they're not heading the ball a lot. So many other variables, it's great, isn't it? Um, prevention, proper technique. This is not proper technique, what you're seeing. Okay, don't wanna do a tackle like that. Neck and shoulder girdle strengthening. Balance, that includes core training, right? The strength of your upper extremities and your lower extremities comes from your core, and additional protective padding can help. So, for example, if you're dealing with someone who's a football player, you can add a cowboy collar, a neck roll, to avoid that additional traction type of stuff, and we would do that with someone that's had a recurrent stinger, for example, from a traction type of injury. Uh, I, I end with saying, you don't stop exercising before you, because you grow old. You grow old because you stop exercising. So it's really clear to all of us here that we need to promote that for our uh, patient population. And this cartoon says, I like to mix up my exercise routine. Sometimes I right click, sometimes I double click. Um, so don't do this, overuse injuries, that's another talk. Thank you for your uh, time, and I think Carlin's gonna say some, oh, I'll take a couple questions and then we need to break for lunch. <laughs>